we started studying the journey of the people of israel from egypt to canaan we just started last week we are about to move today we know that it took them 40 years to journey through wilderness and reach canaan we don't have much time like that so we need to finish as as early as possible so i want you to run with me so that we can finish the journey as early as possible we have not yet come to the actual journey we are still looking to the background here we go okay be with me we started the subject looking the background of egyptian slavery of the people of israel last week in that we saw the call of abram we closed no, yes. last week with Sliding our uh we closed last week with the god's promise abraham was receiving regarding his descendants as well as the inheritance we <clears throat> we saw in genesis chapter 15 verses 5 and 6 and he took him outside god took abram outside and said now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them and he said to him so shall your descendants be then he believed in the word the lord and he credited it to him as righteousness we saw that god promised abraham that he is going to bless his descendants like the stars in the sky we should remember that there was a time that abraham had no single child at all but still even in this advanced stage he was willing to take the words of the lord for granted and believe what he promised there we see that he believed in the lord what the lord has promised him and that was accounted him as righteousness then we come to verse 7 and 8 of the same chapter there we saw the lord continued with uh, giving promise about his uh, inheritance then he said to him i am the lord who brought you out of ur the chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it and he said lord god how shall i know that i will inherit it you remember even we have seen when god promised about descendants abram was willingly accept it and he believed it was counted as righteousness for him then the lord continues with promising him about the inheritance when the lord told him that i am the god who brought you out from your native place and i'm going to give you this land this land of canaan which is the most blessed land upon the earth since you obeyed me and followed me i'm going to bless you with this blessed land that was what god has told abraham but there abraham was ready to take the words of the lord for granted he was asking for a proof he asking how can i know that i will inherit in the land of canaan you know he had faith to accept the promise about his descendants but he had no faith to accept the promise about inheritance can you imagine probably why why he was not able to take for granted by faith the promise concerning his inheritance why he was willingly and readily accepted the promise about his descendants i think he was depending on his logic that's why he had little problem in accepting the promise concerning his inheritance i'll explain you now descendants god was promising something he doesn't have but he but it it doesn't belong to anybody else at the moment of course he doesn't have a child and god promised that he will give a child he believed it because his child is not yet received and nobody else has his child 
So God is going to give him something that is not existing, something that doesn't belong to somebody else. So he was ready to believe it. But as far as inheritance is concerned, that is also something he doesn't have now, but that belongs to somebody else now. You understand? The land belongs to other nations now. There is a, 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 a people, a, a nation who has occupied it, who has owners of this. So there is more difficulty for getting that from their hands rather than getting something which he doesn't have at the moment. That was the logical thinking of Abraham probably. That's why he found it a little difficult to accept it without a proof and he was asking for a proof. No, this can be the case in our life also. We depend on our logic to believe what God says. We rely on our rational mind to understand spiritual things and we fail to understand. That's why many a times doubts arose in our mind. That's why we are not able to take the word of God for granted. Many a times we doubt because we are not willing to accept the words by faith. Sometimes we rely on our rational mind, our logic, and see the, the possibility and impossibility. Check the yes and no of that. And then only we are willing to accept it. For example, I'll give you an example. Okay. We know God can heal when we are suffering from cold. No, we, when we have cold or normal fever, we pray and God heals us. We believe that God can heal our cold or fever. But with that mind, are we able to believe that God can heal cancer also? God who is able to heal cold is the God who is able to heal even cancer also because for an almighty God, cold and cancer makes no difference. For finite people like us with limited knowledge and limited resources, we see it in different uh, zones, in different ways. But for, a, for an almighty God who is God of all the impossibilities, Nothing is impossible to him. So for him, both cold and cancer are same. He can heal cold. He can heal us from cancer. There is no difficulty for God to heal cancer when it is easy for God to heal cold. Don't think like that. But our logic, our rational mind sometimes make us think like that. Okay, we have a verse in Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6 that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. Which means, do not lean on your logic. Do not lean on your rational thinking. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. This is what God wants us to have in the life of each one of us. Not depending on our understanding our experience, our logic, but trusting the Lord fully in all the ways of our life, with all our heart and with all our mind, and acknowledging him in all our ways that he will make our paths straight, which means he will remove all the obstacles, he will remove all the problems, whether it be cold or cancer or whatever it may be, he is able to make straight in our path irrespective of the seriousness of the obstacles. That's what it says. Okay, so we need to have that mind in, in approaching the problems that we face in our life. So we have the first lesson to learn today. Do not allow our logic to limit our faith in an almighty God who is the God of impossibilities. Our limited mind, our fallible mind sometimes Tempt as to, to limit God's possibilities, just as what I mentioned concerning cold and cancer. When we think God can do many things, sometimes, sometimes 
we think, at least in our heart, whether can God do that or not? Is God able to do that or not? Sometimes we doubt because we rely on our logic. Do not allow our logic, our rational mind to limit our faith in an almighty God. Oh, dear ones, our God is an almighty God. Nothing is impossible to him. He is the one who created the whole universe by the word. He said, let that be. And that came into existence. He is the one who is holding the whole universe by the power of his word. And it is that God who is our father. It's our, that God who is our heavenly father. Nothing is impossible to him. We should believe that. We should wholeheartedly believe that, dear ones. May the Lord help us to take for granted the words of the Lord. Let's not rely on our logic and limit our faith in an almighty God. Without his love, his compassion, his mercy, when we doubt his power. Okay? So let the let this be a lesson in our life. Well, moving further in verse 9 to 14, God was putting some suggestions to confirm Abraham that his promise concerning inheritance is going to be fulfilled. Or God wanted to make a treaty with Abraham to come into a, a treaty with Abraham that he is going to fulfill his promise. Therefore, he told Abraham to bring few things and offer it before him. And upon those things, those things which are offered, he will ratify, he will finalize a deal with Abraham that he is going to inherit this land without any doubt. And God says, I'm going to come enter into a treaty, a contract with you. So bring these things. Verses 9 through 14, we read, So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a thatched dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Verse 12 onwards. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And then also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Now, remember the background in your mind. Keep that in your mind. There was a problem for Abraham to believe about his inheritance. Okay? What God is going to give his posterity, his generation. Then God told Abraham to bring some items to enter into a treaty with him. There could be an oath, a pledge, a contract between Abraham and God that what God promised will work out, will come true in the days ahead. Okay? So he was uh, asked to bring a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female God, a three-year-old ram, <coughs> a turtle dove, a young pigeon, Abraham brought all these things. Since it was to be offered to the Lord and there is a treaty between God and Abraham, the procedure was supposed to be to cut that into two pieces from the middle and upon that God will enter into a treaty with Abraham on two parts, one part from God and one part from Abraham. There, they will enter into a treaty. Probably that would have been the idea when God told them, told him to bring all these things. And that's why Abraham cut those things into two from the middle and kept it open. But there we see that Abraham did not cut the birds. He kept the birds as it is. And when the vultures came 
upon the carcass, he drove them away. Now from verse 12 onwards, we see that something happened during the night. He fell upon, fell upon a deep sleep fell upon him. Then God appeared to Abraham. God was speaking to Abraham. And then God says, you should know for sure that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and they will remain there for 400 years as slaves there to serve them. And then I will bring them out from the land. Okay, the occasion was to confirm the inheritance. Inheritance is for his generation, right? Abraham was told to bring something before God so that they can enter into a treaty. Abraham brought as God told him, but he was not ready to kill the birds. He did not kill the birds. He did not uh, cut the birds. Okay. Then in the night, in the evening, there was a problem with Abraham. He fell into deep sleep. Then God appeared and said that your descendants will be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. We need to connect these together. This punishment or this statement from God came because of something that Abraham did wrong before God. Okay, we can understand from the situation. It's not mentioned there. Don't ask me where it is mentioned. The question was how he can know that his, his, his generation will inherit the land. God told him, bring some items and we will enter into a treaty. Abraham wrote as God has asked him, but he did not completely obey God. He did not cut the birds. We will come to that later. That means it was not a full obedience. It was not a complete honoring of God. Therefore, God appeared to him in the evening and said that since you did not completely obey my word, first of all, you did not believe my word, you wanted a proof, then I told that I will give you a proof, but even bringing about that proof and entering into a treaty, you did not act according to what I said. Therefore, you should know that that very descendants whom you wanted to inherit this land, about whom you had doubt of your inheritance, know that they are going to be slaves, strangers in another land for 400 years. That means it came as a punishment because of that response of Abraham, because of that act of Abraham. Now let's look to that act. What was it? In verse 9 and 10, we saw, as I mentioned, verse 9 and 10, he brought them all as the Lord demanded. But in verse 12, then we see that he offered them, but he did not uh, cut the birds. He was asked to bring, uh, okay, uh, he was asked to bring a turtle dove and a young pigeon, okay? So there was a turtle dove, a young pigeon, two birds, which he did not cut a center. Probably he had a little bit of soft corner, uh, a sort of uh, you know, liking to that uh, uh, innocent birds. He did not want to cut it. So he just kept like that. Maybe he was uh, having a little bit of uh, soft corner to that bird. He don't want to cut it. Okay, that's why he kept as it is when he cut other animals. You understand? That means he had little affection or compassion to those birds than obeying God. He preferred to show his compassion, his kind-heartedness to that two birds at the expense of obedience to the word of God. This God did not like. Or even it is mentioned that when vultures came upon the carcass, he drove them away. Probably he wanted to present his sacrifice just as it is. He didn't want to uh, have the vultures take it away. 
he wanted to present that he wanted to display that he wanted to keep that like that to see that something he has brought for the lord probably it was the reason that he don't allow the vultures to eat the carcass well anyway it displeased god that's why there is a punishment for his descendants to be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years okay uh well we also sometimes pass through similar situations we know we need to obey god we take the word of god seriously but sometimes we have we show some soft corner to something that we love most something that is very dear to us something which are very pretty to us no some occasions happens like that for example i can give you well uh, many situations in our life okay you you don't want to go to church because you have a little child and uh, uh, the child will be disturbed or there is uh, the climate is not good the child can get uh, cold or fever or sick that's why you don't want to take the child you are more sympathetic or compassionate to the child that you prefer to skip the meeting that means you are showing little more compassion to your child than obeying god than being in the presence of god than being worshiping the lord okay sometimes you have uh, a get together of some friends okay you don't want to disappoint your friends because of your absence so you decide that you will skip the meeting that day because you want to be with the friend that means you are honoring your friends more than god you give preference to your friends more than god just as abraham did now he was not willing to kill those innocent two birds he just wanted to show some sympathy to them he just kept that as it is okay again <clears throat> sometimes we wanted to have some satisfaction about what we do for the lord maybe probably because of that he did not allow the vultures to to eat the carcass he drove them as i said no he just wanted to display that and he wanted to watch and see what all things he brought for the lord you know sometimes we wanted to see that uh, we are doing lot of things for the lord mm? just uh, looking to a, a receipt also that you get from the assembly for a donation that you did and you feel like oh i did a great job oh, i was able to do a great work for the lord isn't it you no know, sometimes you keep account of donations or what you give for the lord later the year and you may take the total and you feel yourself little bit proud oh this year i gave this much to the lord right things can happen like that just as what abraham did you wanted to display your activities for the lord you wanted to be satisfied with your what you are doing for the lord and you want to uh, look at it and to feel little bit of uh, uh, what to say satisfaction and little bit of bliss for being able to do something for the lord all these things can be compared to what abraham did with regard to not splitting the words having little bit of compassion to him he did not allow the vultures to eat it away he wanted to see that remaining there to display that because of these situations the lord was not pleased the lord said <clears throat> your descendants are going to suffer for that if you have if you do not take my word for granted that i will give this land to the descendants you said you need a proof when i said bring something to enter into a treaty with you as a proof as a promise then you had some soft corner for some pretty birds you wanted to keep them you wanted to be more compassionate to them than obeying me you did not allow the vultures to eat what you have brought you wanted to display it you wanted to be satisfied with what you have brought to me if that is the case your descendants are going to be 
living as slaves in a foreign country for 400 years. Now, Abraham was not much concerned about possessing the land. He was not material minded for sure. If he had preference for material things, he would have never come out when God called him from the land of Ur, where he was a very rich man, it seems. Okay, so he was least concerned about material things, but he had concern about his children and their future. That's why he wanted to make sure that God will give this land to his descendants. You understand? He himself was a man of faith. He can manage living in the tent. He did not want all these things to be his. He's happy with that. He gave up everything that he had and obeyed the word of God. But still, he wanted to make sure that his posterity, his generation occupy this land. They enjoy the blessings of God. That means he had some concern about his generation, about the welfare of his generation. This also sometimes happens in our life. We are very spiritual. We are committed. We don't go after material wealth. We don't uh, feel like doing a lot of things uh, for our own welfare or our own uh, physical pleasure. <clears throat> At the same time, we are concerned about our children, their future, you know, what we need to give for the Lord. Sometimes we, we keep a portion of that also for the study of our children, for the future, for doing things for our children, because we are more concerned about our children than God's cause. It can happen, like what happened in the life of Abraham. So what did the Lord say? Since you have more concern about your generation, since you are more concerned about your descendants, just know that they are going to suffer for 400 years in a foreign land. <coughs> so we have a lesson here to learn and to keep in our mind. The second lesson, if you have your own preferences against obeying God's will and honoring God, even our generation will also be made to reap its consequences. You understand what it means? When God told Abraham to bring all those animals and birds, he would have completely obeyed God. But he had little preference of his own, having a bit of compassion to those uh, innocent birds. He did not kill them, kept as it is. He had little bit of... Uh, uh, what to say, boasting or a vain glory for what he brought before God that he did not allow the vultures to eat that. Then, the, then his generation, his descendants also were made to reap its consequences. Okay, that is a lesson that we can learn here. If you have your own preferences taken as obeying God's will and honoring God, just as I told you, you are more concerned about your child. You're more concerned about your friends than being with the company of God's people being in fellowship with God. You skip meetings. You avoid assembly gatherings and go for other things. That means you have your own preference than honoring God. If you do so, just remember that even your generation will be made to reap its consequences. That's what we learn from here because God says, you had more concern about your descendants. You had more concern about the inheritance of your descendants. And you had your own preferences when I told you to do something for me. Now, because of that, your descendants are going to be slaves in a foreign land where they will be slaves for 400 prolonged years. If you have your own preference against obeying God's command, against doing God's will and honoring God, even our generation will be made to reap its consequences. It's very serious see this dear ones. Let's remember that. Yet our God is gracious and compassionate. Even though he punishes 
he is gracious and compassionate there itself he is giving the promise of the deliverance the punishment is mentioned their deliverance also is mentioned there you remember when we studied the subject salvation we saw in genesis chapter 3 that when adam and eve disobeyed god and committed sin there god pronounced their judgment their punishment at the very context even there itself god has given the promise of the salvation god said the <clears throat> the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and he will deliver them and also god himself had made a covering of skin and covered their nakedness giving a sign that god himself will cover the consequences of sin and later he accomplished that at the cross of calvary by crushing his own son the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world our god is a god who is righteous our god is a god who is holy he punishes sin at the same time he is a god of compassion he is a god of forgiveness not only that he punish but also he provides a remedy from our sin and that is the compassion that's the mercy loving kindness of our god oh let's thank god for that even today we are in god's presence because of that loving kindness that compassion that god showed to us as through his son lord jesus christ by crushing him at the cross and saving us from the penalty of our sin thank god let's thank god for that dear ones hallelujah our god is a compassionate god now moving further we see the the second part is the deliverance so we saw the reason for the slavery in the land of egypt now speaks about the deliverance we look to the deliverance god works out to fulfill his promises as he made in chapter 15 of genesis verse 13 in the fullness of time we see that god started working to deliver the people from the bondage of egypt even as we see with regard to salvation also when god has promised to adam and eve that the seed of woman shall crush the head of satan and when god promised a, a deliverance through his son we see that <clears throat> jesus christ came to this world and uh, took his our sins upon him and we in we read in galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 but when the fullness of time came god sent his son born of a woman born under the law from the fullness of time came in the appropriate time in the fullness of time god's deliverance will be manifested for the people of israel as well as the people of the whole world that god manifested his deliverance at the fullness of time sending a deliverer for the egyptian bondage moses was sent as the deliverer for the bondage of each one of us under sin and satan his own son lord jesus christ was sent as the deliverer that we are delivered to be in his presence so we will look to the the process of deliverance first of all we should know that for deliverance there should be a, a deliverer is required a, a leader is required we see that god uses human agents to fulfill his purpose when god promised to abraham that they will be brought out from the land after 400 years judging those people who troubled them god is using a human agent as the leader to fulfill his purpose we know god is the one who created the whole universe by 
the power of his word. As I mentioned earlier, he, he pronounced that, let there be, and it came into existence. God is the God who carries the whole universe by the power of his word. He can do anything and everything by himself. At the same time, he likes to use human agents for fulfilling his purposes. Almighty God likes to work with weak human beings like you and I, you and me to accomplish his purpose if we are dedicated and we are obedient. The Almighty God, God who can do anything and everything, would like to work with us and use as human agents to fulfill his program, his plan in this world if we are dedicated and we are obedient to God. Oh dear ones, isn't it great to be co-workers of such a great God? Isn't it wonderful, dear brothers and sisters, to be co-workers of this great and mighty God? God wants to use us to fulfill his purpose in this world, even today. We are blessed people. And the third lesson that we can learn from here is God wants to engage us in his business and would like to work with us if we are dedicated and obedient. If we have the dedication and if we have the mind of obedience, God wants to engage us in his business, in his wonderful plan for this world. God wants us to to be part of that company of people who would accomplish God's plan and purpose upon this earth. Are you ready? Do you want to be in that company? We should be dedicated and we should be obedient. God can use only who are dedicated, who are uh, obedient to God. Not that we are qualified. In First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, we see that wonderful verse, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God has chosen us who were considered to be foolish things of this world and has given us wisdom to accomplish his purpose. Oh, thank God. God has chosen us who would be the foolish things of this world and has given us wisdom to accomplish his purpose. God has chosen us who are weak things of this world and has given us his strength to accomplish his purpose. Not because of our might, but by his power, we can accomplish his purpose have been chosen by him to be co-workers of God. What a privileged people we are, oh dear ones. Chosen to accomplish the purpose of God. Chosen to accomplish the wonderful purpose of God. God has chosen us to work with him. What a blessed people we are to be engaged in the business of God. How much we ought to thank God for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, when God wants to use us for his purpose, remember, his arch enemy, Satan, is always at work. We know Satan is the arch enemy of God. And what is his main agenda? What is the main agenda of Satan? The main agenda of Satan is to hinder and topple the purposes of God, that is his plan, that is his agenda. So whenever God works, we can see that Satan also is at work to hinder God's plan. Even in our life also, when God works, we should also know that Satan also is active to hinder that, to topple that, to destroy that. 
in connection with the leader whom God has chosen to deliver his people as promised to Abraham, we see that Satan was active. Satan was bringing about uh, his strategy to destroy that leader. We see in Exodus chapter 1, Satan implementing his strategy to, to destroy God's leader. There we see in chapter 1, Pharaoh was instructing two midwives, Shipra and uh, Pua, to kill all the boy bo baby boys of Israel. We read there that they feared God and they did not do that. And they had given some excuse. And later, when we come to the last verse of chapter 1 of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1 verse 22, there we see that Pharaoh is commanding all the people of Israel that every son who is born, they had to throw them into the river of Nile and all the daughters born to them, they can keep alive. That was the commandment. That was the strict order Pharaoh given to the people of Israel. It was the strategy of Satan to destroy God's leader to deliver them from the land of Egypt. That was a strategy of Satan to topple God's plan for deliverance. When we come to Exodus chapter 2, we can see some very interesting thing. When Satan brought about his strategy to destroy the leader whom God has brought about to deliver the people of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, in chapter 2 of Exodus, we see that God was using that very treachery of Satan to make his leader grow in the palace of Pharaoh as the son of the daughter of Pharaoh and to be trained in all the wisdom, knowledge and martial art of the land of Egypt. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it wonderful? Satan has brought about his strategy to destroy God's leader. That's why he walked through Pharaoh and made a command that all the baby boys born to the people of Israel should be drawn in the river of Nile. And God used that very strategy of Satan to make his leader grow in the palace of that very Pharaoh who proclaimed that all bo baby boys should be killed, there he is trained with all the wisdom, knowledge and martial art of Egypt to be capable of delivering his people from the land of Egypt. That's how God works. Wonderful way of God's work. We see in Acts chapter 7 and verse 22, Stephen, in his final address, he mentioned that Acts chapter uh, <clears throat> two, uh, 7 verse 22, Acts 7 22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of Egyptians and he was proficient in speaking and action. That means he had all the training, the best training in the palace of the Pharaoh, in the wisdom, knowledge, and uh, martial arts, that he could be the best person to be appointed as the next Pharaoh. That was the training that he got. God used the very strategy of Satan to destroy him as a source for him to be trained in the best way to deliver the people from the land of Egypt. Here we have the third lesson. The next lesson we can have, fourth lesson. Every problem the enemy brings in our life 
to destroy us can be changed by God as the best resources for our blessing if we dedicatedly wait upon the Lord. You understand, dear ones? Every problem the enemy brings in our life to destroy us, to block the plan of God in our life can be changed by God as the best means, as the best resources for our blessing if we are dedicatedly wait upon the Lord. As dear ones, what Satan can bring in our life to destroy us can be transformed by God as the source of our blessing provided we wait upon the Lord in full dedication. We can see Joseph as the best example in Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, his brother, his brother sold him as a slave because of jealousy. And then we see Potiphar's wife falsely accused him and put him in jail. Then we see the butler of Pharaoh forgot him by his ignorance. But God used all those means to bring Joseph to the palace of Pharaoh in the right time to explain his dream and to be appointed as the second in his kingdom. Isn't it wonderful, dear ones? Isn't it great? All those people did against Joseph to destroy him, his brothers because of the jealousy, Potiphar's wife because he was not acting according to her wish, then the butler of Pharaoh by his busy schedule, he forgot him. We can think that it was unfortunate, but for God, God was using all those means to bring Joseph to the palace of Pharaoh at the right time that he could be appointed as the second to Pharaoh and his people will be delivered from the famine that was coming forth. That was the plan of God. Oh dear one, this is something that we really need to understand and take for granted in our life. When we face problems in our workplace, when we have you know, hard taskmasters, sometimes we ask God, God, why my boss is like this? When you pass through difficulties, you ask God, God, why are you allowing me to pass through such situations? When you have various instances in your life that you think that is unfortunate, that is torturing, that is actually putting you in trouble, you question God, you doubt God's love and care. You become sometimes rebellious. But remember all those instances. Whether it be brought by Satan, your enemy. God can use that. God can turn that out to be your best means of blessing. If you obediently wait upon the Lord. If you dedicatedly wait upon the Lord. Till the fourth watch. Till the time that God will show his glory. That is what God expresses from us. Now many a times when things go against what we expect. We become bitter. Now we are, we need to go to uh, uh, some place very urgently. And as we come out, there is heavy traffic. You cannot go further. No, you get upset. Oh, why? Why God is why? Uh, you get bitter. You started uh, uh, no, uh, cursing your time or some reason because you are late or something. Some or other you would say. But you don't know. Probably God is blocking your way to keep you safe some, some, from some other problems which you don't know. Or God is protecting you from a danger that your enemy has put, uh, has uh, arranged ahead. Yes, we should know that. We should understand that. This is the truth that we need to accept in our life. Even when our enemy, even others 
bring into our life the worst situation our god can turn out that to be the best resource for your blessing if you wait upon the lord dedicatedly if you wait upon the lord and uh, allow god to work in your life the strategy of satan to destroy god's leader god uses that very strategy to train his leader in the best place with the best training and with the best resource and this god is our god dear ones this god is working for us even today in difficult times in problems in sickness in difficulties in poverty in difficult situations seemingly that is a tough time a hard time but still god is at work god has a plan and god can turn out that to be your best blessing in this world as well as in the world to come in the eternity praise god don't become bitter don't become rebellious don't question god don't give up your spirituality don't stop praying go closer to the lord and wait upon the lord and you will be able to see the glory of god and you will see how god can turn out that worst situation in your life to be the best blessing yes god can do that may the lord help us to understand these truths as we study uh, the journey of the people of israel from Egypt to Canaan. Let's look to those four lessons that we learned today quickly, and uh, we will conclude. Lesson one: Do not allow our logic to limit our faith in an Almighty God, who is the God of impossibilities. Our God is a God of impossibilities. Nothing is impossible to God. Do not allow our logic or rational thinking to limit God's power, which can work wondrous things. in our life lesson 2 if you have your own preferences against obeying god god's will and honoring god even our generation will also be made to reap its consequences when we are more concerned about generation and uh, we try to help them out at the risk of god's word and god's commandments and honoring god please keep this in mind that they will be made to reap the consequence let's go to the presence of god hand over everything our life our children's life our future our generation god said i will honor who honors me hand over to him don't be concerned about our children or our generation if we commit our life to the lord and commit our children to the lord he will take care of it he is a faithful god okay and the third lesson we saw god wants to engage us in his business and would be would like to work with us if we are dedicated and obedient we are the most blessed people in this world having privilege to work with the creator of this universe what more we need oh dear ones we are the blessed people to work with the creator of this world what we need is to dedicate ourselves and be obedient god will use us mightily and the last lesson that we saw is every problems the enemy brings in our life to destroy us can be changed by god as the best resource for our blessing if we dedicately wait upon the lord if we dedicately wait upon the lord every problem that the enemy brings in our life to destroy us can be changed by god as the best resource for our blessing god is a mighty god he can change things up start up he can change the world upside down to work his purpose in our life just wait upon the lord and see the glory of god may god bless us with these words and may the lord help us to practice these 
thoughts that the Lord has given us today to edify our Christian living and to be more faithful in following the Lord. May his name be glorified. Thank you.